Some people say that gymnastics is physics breaking, but in reality, it's physics that makes gymnastics pretty awesome. We went to go talk to Julio Diaz to see what's up. In order to talk about physics and gymnastics, I had to find a quiet place to think. So I came here to this thing. So we went to the 21C library to rent a room. Let's check it out. Hey Karim, Julio here. So now that I'm stationary in this room, uh, I actually want to talk about the flips and uh, gymnastics, but I don't know anything about physics. Uh, but speaking of stationary, I did look up uh, angular momentum. So let's talk about that. All right, angular momentum is the rotational equivalent of linear momentum. And everybody understands momentum uh, if you just say it's inertia in motion. So things that are spinning faster have more angular momentum and things that have more inertia rotationally have more angular momentum. So technically, it's the radius cross product with the linear momentum, or for a rigid body, it's the moment of inertia times the rotational velocity, uh, I omega. Um, so in layman's terms though, rotational or angular momentum is just simply kind of how much inertia you have as you're spinning. So faster and heavier would have more of it. So basically, angular momentum as it applies to gymnastics basically means that the more weight or mass that you do have, it'll be harder to flip and rotate as well as starting and stopping that rotation. Angular momentum doesn't exist alone though. There's another thing called angular velocity and it goes hand in hand. All right, angular velocity, um, that's a symbol that we use in physics. It looks like a W, kind of curly, it's called omega. And omega is measured in radians per second, um, which uh, there's two pi radians in a full complete revolution. Um, but it is the rate at which uh, an object rotates about an axis um, a certain number of radians, degrees, or revolutions. All right, so angular velocity as it applies to gymnastics, of course, the more twists that you want to do in a flip means that you are going to have to try and spin faster, which is where angular velocity comes into play. So basically, the more twists you want to do, the faster your angular velocity will need to be. After speaking to Mr. Mac, I think I know a little bit more about physics. So in nature, there's a thing called torque, and basically it means that when a rigid object is tossed up, there needs to be a twisting force applied to it. Briefly define torque. All right, I can, I can do that because I have a visual aid. Sometimes my students get tired of me teaching torque. It's wheelie bad. Anyway, all right, torque is like the rotational version of force. So if you want something to move from rest, you gotta shove it around with a force. So I can move it in the y direction, in the x direction, in the mysterious z direction. But if I want this wheel to rotate, I can't just exert a force because that doesn't do anything. I have to exert a force at a very special direction. So if you think of, let's move this here, there's a little flag there. The radius goes from the axis of rotation to here. I have to apply my force at 90 degrees, like L, 90 degrees. So if I exert a force at 90 degrees, I make the thing change its state of motion. So it wasn't rotating, now it is. If I want to slow it down, the same thing so I'm letting friction do that. So in order for things to be able to twist slash rotate there needs to be a 90 degree force applied to the object or person in other words 
So in gymnastics, this would be the act of bringing this shoulder down to my opposite knee in order to get that twisting force applied. There's another component called rotational inertia, which is after you start a flip, you don't want to over rotate and this comes into play. Ah, rotational inertia. This is my favorite one. And so all gymnasts know this and figure skaters know it. In fact, little children know this. So the basic concept of rotational inertia is that some things are harder to rotate than others. I have another visual aid. I happen to have two objects that have the same mass. So this one's made out of wood because there's more stuff, more volume. And this one's made out of steel. There's less stuff or less volume, but they weigh the same. So if I drop them, they obviously hit the ground at the same time. On a balance, they weigh the same amount. But one of these is really hard to rotate and one is really easy to rotate. So I'm going as fast as I can here and as fast as I can here. This one's way easier to rotate. So with rotational inertia, it's not just how much mass, it's also where is the mass. So this one on average, the mass is closer to the center. This one on average, the mass is farther away. So children, sorry about that, children know if you put them on a balance beam and they're about to fall, they put their arms out. All of us do that. By putting your arms out, it's actually harder for you to rotate this way. If you bring your arms in, it's really easy to rotate that way. So it's a natural thing that we understand. Um, for linear motion, inertia, all that matters is how many molecules you're made out of. For rotation, not quite that simple. All right, so for rotational inertia, as it applies to gymnastics, is the closer the mass is to the center, the easier it is going to rotate, which explains why a back tuck is easier to do than a back pike, and a back pike is easier to do than a back straight. And also this explains why that kicking out works so well to stop the rotation in a flip. Center of mass is also pretty important when it comes to flips, as it has to do with starting and stopping the rotation. Center of mass, all right. Center of mass is the cool people way of saying center of gravity. Um, center of mass is better than saying center of gravity because you could be out in interstellar space um, like the Voyager 2 spacecraft, and you may have very little gravity acting on you, but you still have a center of mass. So for humans, it's somewhere kind of around the belly button area deep inside your body, and depending on how you're built. But the general idea is it's a weighted average, um, taking into account, again, where is your mass located? And you take this average, and it takes all of your mass into account, your shape, your size, your volume, and it pinpoints where gravity would act. So you can imagine your center of mass is where if somebody crushed you into a blob and you're just a sphere, that would be your center. And so that's where all the forces of gravity act. All right, so center of mass in double flips, there's one specific point that seems to not move, even though technically it is still rotating. But the spot you will see in double flips, triple flips, maybe even single flips is the center of mass and that's where all the outer mass rotates around the one specific point so again this is between your mid stomach and your hips in order to do a flip you need hang time which is how long gravity is affecting you hang time all right hang time is a term that we use in sports hang time is uh, for like a punted football is going to be how long that it, the ball appears to hang in the air. So hang time is how long you are under the influence of gravity only. So for a gymnast on a trampoline, if um, Taylor here is jumping uh, off the trampoline, the second he leaves the trampoline, he's going to be experiencing a certain amount of time that gravity takes to slow him down at the top and then continue to speed him up back down toward the ground. I like to tell students, imagine gravity fairies are jumping on you the whole time. Eventually they're gonna win, but they don't stop and they keep pushing you down. So the second that his feet come back down to the trampoline, then other forces are gonna be acting on him and his hang time is over. And so really good jumpers appear to hang in the air, like my air quotes. That's hang time. 